<laughs> Will you all join me in reading today's pas- passage of Scripture? You'll see up there, aloud. Here we go. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Now you may be seated. Well, good morning. Great to see you, family. I've been looking forward to this time together. My title this morning is, What Do You Expect? What do you expect? The question I'd like to explore is, uh, what do you expect from your life of following Jesus Christ? That is, when you personally came to faith in Jesus, what, what was it that you thought you were signing up for? And if any time has passed since then, what are your expectations now with regard to what the life of Christian discipleship should look like compared to then? And moreover, what does the Bible say that you can expect as a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus? Uh, Within Acts chapter 9, verses 19 to 31, the passage that we just read together, there is, I think, an observable outline from the life of Saul, or Paul, as we are going to come to know him moving forward, that that provides an understandable pattern for establishing realistic expectations. Now, if you were here last week or, or watched online, you'll recall that uh, we took some time last week to uh, think about and observe the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, perhaps uh, the third most important event in the New Testament after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, um, and certainly, I think, one of the most important events in the history of the world. Uh, because the contribution of Paul the Apostle transformed uh, the world as he proclaimed Christ. Well, when Saul, um, blinded by his encounter with the radiant intensity of the glory of Christ, had been led into the city of Damascus, he was taken to the house of a man named Judas And God then spoke to one of his disciples in Damascus, a man named Ananias, and sent him to lay hands on Saul so that he could regain his sight. And I wonder if you recall what what Ananias said when God gave him that directive. He objected. He said, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. I don't know if Ananias' voice quavered as he said those words, if he stuttered, if he hesitated. But remember God's response. He said, go, for he is a chosen instrument 
of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, or I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Check that out. God said, Saul is a chosen instrument of mine. And then he added, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Chosen to suffer. Chosen to suffer. So three things here. First of all, he's mine. I have chosen him. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Chosen to suffer for the name of Christ. I wonder, is is that an attractive definition of discipleship uh, for you? Uh, Is that the one you had in mind when you trusted in Christ, became a follower of his? Certainly not one that you're going to get from the televangelists. Am I right? You know, when I was a a wee lad, the church my, my family attended would frequently have these things that they called testimony services. And at testimony services there, usually on Sunday evenings, um, people would be invited and encouraged to share the story of how they came to faith in Christ or how God was working in their lives at that particular time. And, and there, there was no small level of kind of social pressure to either stand where you were and in a loud voice share your testimony or to come up on the platform like here and get in front of a mic, and that that was even more intimidating for many people. But often when, when people shared their testimony about believing in Jesus, they would say something like, and it's been just great ever since. And I remember that distinctly. Share their testimony, they trusted in Christ, and oh, it's just been great ever since. And I was happy for them. You know, as a kid, you think, oh, that's awesome. But I came to believe kind of that that was the way it was supposed to be, right? That if I trusted in Jesus, gave my life to him, lived obediently, that things would be just great. But over time, I began to watch their lives and I recognized that they had some of the same struggles with sin that I had and Everybody I knew had. And it began to dawn on me that following Jesus can actually make your life a little harder. That that those who weren't following him seemed to actually have it a little easier. And so being a follower of Jesus was maybe going to cost me something, that that I might give my life to Christ and it, it wouldn't be just great all the time. So what do you expect from the life of discipleship, this life of following and serving Jesus Christ? What what can we learn from the life of Saul that will inform our expectations about this thing called the Christian life? And I'd like to point out four observations in the message, uh, in this message, and then we're going to reflect on their meaning and application for our lives. And those points are in order. First of all, Saul was chosen yet he experienced fear and skepticism. Secondly, Saul was chosen, yet he experienced a prolonged period of preparation. Third, Saul was chosen, yet he experienced suffering. And fourth, Saul was chosen, yet he still needed a real friend. We're going to come back to those in order. So let's begin with that first one, that Saul was chosen by God, and yet he experienced fear and skepticism from other believers. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. So notice, first of all, that that when Christ kind of crashed Saul's career and, and, and began a process of total transformation in his life, that he was met with fear, with skepticism, with resistance, 
even opposition from, of all people, other believers. Other believers in Jesus. Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? Has he not come here to do the same to us? Is this kind of a, this is kind of a Trojan horse kind of deal. We, we know that story. And to a degree, it's understandable, right? I mean, imagine someone like uh, Osama bin Laden. He can't visit personally, but somebody, somebody like him, imagine him having converted to Christianity, believed in Jesus, and asked to join our church. Uh, would we invite him to meet the pastor? You know, I might wear a bulletproof vest, Kevlar helmet, pretty sure. Would we invite him to the next steps class and uh, help him find a place of ministry? Uh, Would we invite him to our life group? Would anyone else then dare show up? I mean, it would have been the same dynamic, right? I mean, Saul had been had been seeking to arrest and extradite Christ followers one day, and then personally identified as one of them the very next day, as it were. And the church kind of needed a little time to catch up with what the Holy Spirit had going on in Saul's life. A few years go by, and we read this in verse 26, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. And and this is after years having passed. See, here's a reality that that every Christ follower needs to understand and take to heart. To be a Christian is is to be added to the church. To be a Christian is to choose the community of believers such as it is, right? Such as it is. To reject, to neglect, to be casual about a vital, consistent participation in the life of a local church is to cast doubt on the sincerity and authenticity of your claim to follow Jesus. And that's not me saying that. That's, this is what the witness of the New Testament is. So Saul's doing the right thing here, isn't he? He's trying to join the church. And yet, he's again met with fear and with skepticism. If you're a new believer or you're thinking about becoming a believer, sometimes this will be your biggest surprise. Uh, It's too often the case that people you most expect to understand you, to cheer what God is doing in your life, simply will not. And it might be your spouse or your children or your parents. Christian friends may doubt you and refuse to take your newfound faith in Jesus seriously. And tragically, when many new believers in Jesus come to the church, they're doubted even by the church, even by pastors and and other leaders. So don't miss this. Even the church, when, when Saul believed in Jesus and had begun teaching and proving in the synagogue, actively ministering, proving that Jesus is the promised Messiah, they didn't have Saul's back. They hadn't embraced him. And this is the church, remember, that that it had experienced Pentecost. They had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. They had devoted themselves to fellowship. And yet instead of extending the right hand of fellowship to Saul, they gave him the left foot. And I can say with all candor this morning that the deepest hurts I have sustained in my life have come at the hands of fellow Christians. And maybe you could say the same. I would add in my case that because of what I do, most of those who have deeply wounded me and hurt my family are people who called me pastor. And I'm not trying to overstate this. I'm not saying poor me. I'm just observing a fact that church can be a hurtful place. Why? Because it's full of real people, recovering sinners, who, whether intentionally or inadvertently, they can't help themselves, say or do things that are not always motivated by either faith or love or sensitivity. And I've been one of them. I've been, I've been the perpetrator. I may be again. So a little dose of reality. When, when you trust in Christ, you're added to the church along with others who have similarly trusted in Christ for a common reason. 
you and they are sinners. You and they are sinners who desperately needed a Savior, and we're all in the process of being transformed so that over time we become more and more like Jesus Christ. But in the interim, it's messy, isn't it? And why? It's because we're messy. We live messy lives. Back in the 90s, heavyweight champion Mike Tyson was preparing for an upcoming match against his challenger, Evander Holyfield. Somebody, some of you will remember this. And Tyson was asked by a reporter whether he was worried about Holyfield's fight plan. It was kind of known that Holyfield's coaches, coaches were a little bit they were regarded as superior to Tyson's. And he, he famously gave this answer. He said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And, and we might see the reaction of the church to Saul as a punch in the mouth. But notice what happened next. Verse 22 says, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. What am I trying to say? When you trust in Christ, others may misunderstand you. They may ridicule you, criticize you, question your motives. Be ready for that. But press on. Allow that opposition, that misunderstanding to take you deeper into Christ. Allow Him to strengthen you. Paul's goal in his life, as he expressed it in Philippians 3.12, was that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. That there was a reason that he saved me. He had a purpose for my life. It wasn't an accident that he intersected my life. Keep serving the God who called you and the Christ who saved you. Keep sharing the gospel and your personal faith in Jesus with others who will listen. Second observation. Saul was chosen, yet he experienced a prolonged period of preparation. Will you notice with me the first five words of verse 23? When many days had passed. How many days is many days? Well, here's the news flash. Many days in this case means three years. Three years. How do we know that? Paul actually told the churches in Galatia in his letter, Galatians 1, verses 15 to 19, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, that is God, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that is Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now imagine that. Three years have passed before Saul, the one who was himself to be numbered among the apostles, before he met another apostle. What was he doing during those years? He went away into Arabia. He didn't have to go far because in those days, in fact, if you look at the very last book of the Bible, the book of maps, and you look at the, the map, of, uh, you know, the Holy Land in, in Paul's day. It'll probably have some title like that. And you'll notice that, that just to the east of Damascus, Syria, was the northernmost tip of Arabia. What did he do in Arabia? Well, we don't know exactly, but, but we can assume, we can kind of glean from other scriptures and allusions and references that he makes that, that during that time, he spent time with Jesus. Jesus spent time with him, teaching him, encouraging him, correcting him, preparing him. And Saul was probably leading Jews to Jesus one by one as he taught in their synagogues. That's probably what he was doing. So he meets Peter and James in Jerusalem. 
after those first three years, and then he disappears again for another 14. And here in Acts, Saul recedes into the shadows. As we're moving forward forward now in our study of Acts, Saul recedes into the shadows. Peter kind of takes over the, the, the spotlight from chapter 9, verse 30, until chapter 12, verse 25. And again, how how do we know it was 14 years? Well, he told the Galatians in chapter 2, verse 1, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. What happened during those 14 years? We're not sure entirely, but he told the Galatians, Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, which, by the way, were not nations at that point. They were provinces, Roman provinces, provinces of the empire. And I was still unknown, notice this, I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. So Saul's preaching the gospel throughout Syria and Cilicia. He apparently received some powerful visions from God. He had his call clarified and sharpened. He he continued to connect the biblical and theological dots in light of Jesus being the Messiah. And and, and he just got to know the Lord and and the Word of God better and better and better. And it's not until chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, that Saul receives his first what we would call a formal missionary commission as the Holy Spirit sets him and Barnabas apart and the church sends them off. And at that time, a full 17 years had passed since that day on the road to Damascus. Nearly two decades of preparation. Now compare Saul's experience with with other significant men in the Bible. Moses, for example, at age 40, left the privilege and splendor of his life in Egypt and fled to Midian where he met a woman, married her, started a family, took a job tending the flocks of his father-in-law. And talk about a career reversal, right? I once was a prince, now I work for that guy. My wife's dad. Woo-hoo. You know, and he must have believed that that was what the rest of his life was just kind of going to look like. Seeing sheep wandering around. But then there was a day when God met him and spoke to him out of a bush that was burning, wasn't consumed. God spoke to him and called him to lead his people out of Egypt. But then, having received that call from God, he spent the better part of another 40 years of his life tending those stupid sheep. David was was surprised to have been anointed by Samuel to succeed King Saul as the ruler of Israel. But another full 15 years, give or take, was went by, most of which David also spent tending his father's sheep before actually taking the throne. And yet it was during that time that that David fought a lion and a bear and killed the Philistine giant Goliath and wrote many of the Psalms, including Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. God told Joseph early in his life that he would be used to save his people Israel and and then he was sold into slavery in Egypt, was falsely accused of attempted rape and spent a few lonely years in prison. It's estimated that Joseph experienced at least 15 years of God's preparation in Egypt before being elevated to the right hand of the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh himself. The prophet Elijah called to be a mighty prophet before he went to the summit of Mount Carmel where all the the drama happened. Remember that? And he confronted the prophets of Baal, called down fire from heaven. Pretty cool moment in his life. Before all of that took place, God sent him to a brook called Kareth. You know what the word Kareth means in Hebrew? It means cut down. So God had some cutting down to do in the life of Elijah and a period of preparation before he could use him powerfully 
another season of waiting on God's purpose, another season of waiting on God's timing. So come back with me, if you will. And if you've got a Bible, a print Bible, you're not going to be able to see this from where you are, but look at your Bible. Between verses 22 and 23, you see the white space there? Between verses 22 and 23. Acts chapter 9, verses... Casey, Acts chapter 9 is where we're at this morning. Between... Between verses 22 and 23, see the white space there? Three years. Three years. Will you let that space, that white space, serve as a symbol to you this morning? Don't waste your white space. Whatever it may be for you. And your white space may be singleness when you'd prefer to be married. It may be joblessness. Or the fact that you feel stuck in a job that does not, cannot, will not ever fulfill you. It might be pain, disappointment, obscurity. Don't waste your white space. Is God at work in your white space? Of course He is. Paul wrote to the believers in Rome saying, We know, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. And a lot of people stop their quotation of the verse there. And they and, and they think they know that what their good is. But they leave out the next phrase, to those who are called according to His purpose. His purpose. This week I was reminded of a line in an old song that said, so when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace His hand, trust His heart. God is always at work in you and for you. What are you doing with your white space? Things may not be moving along as quickly as you think they should. You may have a call from God that no one else knows about. Or if they do, they may not understand it. They may not even affirm it or approve of it. And I want to encourage you, don't waste your white space. Hold on to that vision, that calling from God. And don't you dare opt out of God's curriculum for your preparation. See, God may or may not give you explanation. But His timing is always perfect all the time. And know this, that what God is doing in you through this time is just as significant, perhaps more significant, than what He intends to do through you later. We are God's masterpiece, Paul said. He created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that long ago He he planned for us to do, that long ago He planned for us to do. Next, Saul was chosen, yet he experienced suffering. Saul was chosen, yet he experienced suffering. You know, I've often wondered when, what went on in the mind of Ananias when, when God countered his hesitations regarding Saul by saying, and I repeat, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And in my twisted little mind, I can hear Ananias breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, cool, if he's going to suffer, I'm good with that. You think you thought that? Or said that? Yeah, I'm not sure either. Maybe. Probably not. You know, the word instrument in verse 15 also means vessel. It means jar or container. When you think about it, a vessel has no, generally no power or worth of its own. Its value is measured in its capacity to serve as a conduit or as a container for something else. It becomes significant not because of what it is, but because of what it contains. The Bible tells us that we who belong to Christ are vessels that contain the Holy Spirit of God, that He takes up residence in us. I heard about a special kind of pottery that's been made exclusively by a tribe in Japan for 400 years. It's called Kintsugi. And the pottery is made just like other kinds of pottery. It's made from clay. It's hardened in a kiln. But having fired that piece of pottery, they bring it out, and after it's cooled, 
They hold it up above a big rock and they drop it on the rock and it shatters into uh, lots of broken pieces. But then lovingly and painstakingly, the artist pieces it back together. And this time, each shard is joined to the others, not using super glue or gorilla glue, but rather with molten gold. Like every pot that's broken, every pot is unique, every break is unique, and instead of repairing an item so that it looks like new, this this technique actually highlights the scars as a part of the design. And the philosophy is that in, in embracing the flaws, in embracing the imperfections, an even stronger, more beautiful piece of art is created. And of course, its value becomes infinitely greater after the rest, restoration than before. Saul became like that kintsugi pot. Later in one of his letters to the church in Corinth, he described some of his experiences. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. I assume that's the kind of stone with rocks. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Think Saul had some bad days? I think he did. His autobiography, if he'd written one, might have been titled, My Worst Life Now. And and don't forget that, that right here in Acts chapter 9, he received two death threats, one from Jews in Damascus and one from Hellenistic or Greek Jews in Jerusalem. And in that same letter to Corinth, he included this, but we have this treasure, the treasure of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Or put another way, death is at work in us so that life may be at work in you. Why did Saul have to suffer for the sake of Jesus' name? I don't know the full answer to that question, but here's something I do know. God wanted to live powerfully in him and to work powerfully through him, and so there was some breaking that had to take place. There was some white space that had to happen in his life. The late A.W. Tozer is famous for this quote, It's doubtful whether God can ever bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Saul the mighty had to become Paul the small. That's the actual meaning of the name Paul. Saul the big deal became Paul the small. Suffering brought that about. When Saul asked God to, for some relief from some of it, God replied, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, content with insults, content with hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, if dependency on God is the objective, which it is, then weaknesses work to your advantage. Suffering helps you get in touch with your weakness. It strips you of your pride. It it exposes your idols. I heard Tim Keller once say that, that some of the most painful times in our lives are when God is digging out some cherished idol. 
Jesus said that Saul was a chosen instrument of mine, of mine. This morning, if you're in Christ, you are a chosen instrument of his. Is it possible that you need to stop trying, as the world directs you to do, to get in touch with who you, who you are, and instead get in touch with whose you are? Because when you get in touch with whose you are, a lot of other things will come clearly into perspective and fall into place. Finally, Saul was chosen, yet he need, still needed a real friend. I think it's significant that one of the first gifts God gave to Saul post-conversion was a friend. He, he may have been a hesitant friend at best, a cautious friend at that. But remember how he greeted Saul when he finally got up and went to that house of Judas on that street called Straight. Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul. Brother Saul. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. See, Ananias became Saul's first Christian friend. He was also, by God's authority and call, his healer and his baptizer. By the time Saul made his way back to Damascus, he had gained some disciples of his own. They were the friends who helped him escape the city. Down through that hole in the wall, the hole in the wall gang were his pals. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. I wonder if you know that to be a Christian is to be added to the church. Do you know that? Let me just say that again. Do you know that to be a Christian is to be added to the church? Some of you didn't hear me. Do you know that to be a Christian is to be added to the church? And so to be a Christian is to choose the community of believers such as it is. Right? Such as it is. And one of the marks of genuine conversion that you have really caught the real disease, that you've really come to know Jesus Christ, is that you choose the community of believers. You seek out the fellowship of believers. That's what Saul did, yet we read in verses 26 to 28, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple, that Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and, out, in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. To be a Christian is to be added to the church. But it's equally true that to be a Christian is to have the church added to you. And that's what God did when he gave Barnabas to Saul as his friend. Barnabas became the vehicle by which the church added themselves to Saul so that they accepted him, they affirmed him, they welcomed him into the ongoing life of the community of believers at Jerusalem. And that is our calling, church. That's our calling, Life Point Church. As as God brings people to us who are trusting in him that we would deliberately, intentionally, purposefully add ourselves to them that we would deliberately, intentionally, purposefully connect relationally with them, that we would embrace them, that we would include them not only in our church, but in our personal lives. It's our amazing opportunity to present ourselves as a new community of friends, a new community of encouragers to those God is adding to us. See, I wonder if you've ever considered that without Barnabas, that there may never have been a Paul. Ever think about that? Without without Ananias, there there may never have been a Paul a Paul either. Some of you know that Barnabas' real name was Joseph. We find that out in Acts chapter four. But the name Barnabas became a kind of nickname because it so characterized who he was and what his life was all about. It means son of encouragement, Barnabas. Son of encouragement. 
He advocated for Saul and became a great encourager and a genuine friend to him and a, a partner in ministry as well as to many others. Saul got by with a little help from his friends. In fact, he got by with a lot of help from his friends and all of us need a lot of help, don't we? God gave him genuine friends, especially in those two men, Ananias and Barnabas. In 1 Timothy 1.16, we learn that Paul offered his life story as a pattern for all of us. In his first letter to his protege, Timothy, he said this about the work of Christ in him, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, that is the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as, notice this, as an, an example an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. That word example means pattern. It's a really cool word in Greek. I'm going to tell you what it sounds like right now. It's, it's hupotupasis. You just want to say that with me because it's kind of fun to say. Hupotupasis. One more time. Hupotupasis. See, you learned something this morning. Twice in his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul invited them I urge you then, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul offered his life as a, a pattern, a hupotupasis of, of what it means to be a disciple. So since we're asking and seeking to answer the question this morning a little bit, what what do you expect from the life of following Christ? Let me suggest four applications that I think come right out of this text. The first is this, that when you experience resistance, and you inevitably will, whether from within or without, confirm your calling in Christ. When you experience resistance, confirm your calling in Christ. Listen to these words of encouragement that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, we know. Would you just underline that if you have your own Bible today? We know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Why? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And in the middle of that short passage, Paul stated emphatically, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. So you can know. It can be known. You can have confidence. Sometimes... When, when we're experiencing resistance, when we're experiencing opposition or persecution, discouragement, uh, it can cause us to question whether we are in fact called and chosen by Christ. Any of you had that experience? I have. This isn't what I thought. This wasn't what I expected. This I, th- I must be doing something wrong because somebody said, and it's all been great since then. And that still kind of echoes in my mind. And, and, and I kind of believe this little lie that it all should be going well. Otherwise, there's something wrong with me. Satan can use those moments, those days, even those seasons to discourage us, to cause us to question our salvation. And I really resonate with this statement from the great Charles Spurgeon who lived a couple, two, three, four lifetimes ago. Addressing the topic of assurance, he said, I have no questions that God chose me. For I am quite sure that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. Isn't that good? And I'm sure he who chose me, and I'm sure he chose me before I was born, or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. He must have elected me for for reasons unknown to me, for I never could find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. So I feel that I'm forced to accept that doctrine, and the doctrine is that that doctrine of God's choosing, that doctrine of God's election, that God chooses us before we ever even consider choosing him. Contemporary leader J.D. Greer put it this way, how do I know? How do I know that God chose me? I believe believe in and love Jesus. 
There's no way you can do that apart from the Holy Spirit. No one says Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. John Newton, the slave trader who came to believe Jesus as his forgiver and leader, once said this, that two things I remember, two things I remember that I am a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. And when he penned those immortal words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He was acknowledging that he hadn't gone out and found himself, but rather that it was Christ who had found him, who had saved him from the wretchedness, from the lostness, from the blindness of his soul. Paul was able to say regarding his own confidence in Christ, I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Similarly, Paul wrote to the church in Rome, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, if God chose you, then you too are His chosen instrument. And He will not fail to accomplish His purposes in you and through you because His purposes for you are unstoppable. When you experience delays, or what seem like delays. Trust His timing. Submit to His process. Make the most of your white space. See, it's important time for God to be preparing you for what lies ahead. You may feel like, well, I was pretty active in ministry, but feels like I've been put on the back burner. And and somebody turned off the heat on the back burner. Know that God is using even those times to prepare you. David wrote in Psalm 27, wait for the Lord. It occurs to me right now as I'm saying this, he, he doesn't say wait for changed circumstances. He says wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. See, God's timing is always perfect. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Something I've learned is that He is never late. Although it feels that way at times, He is always, always, always right on time. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, It is God who is at work in you, first to give you the desire to do what He wants, and then to give you the power to do it. And I love that because I don't always have the desire and I know I know I don't have the power. And it all comes from Him. Third, when you suffer, give thanks. When you suffer, give thanks. Say, really? Jesus said, blessed are you when others revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you and it's because Jesus spoke those words that Peter was able to echo later beloved do not be surprised do not be startled do not be shocked do not be willed be bewildered don't be thrown off your game at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you as if it's something other than God's curriculum but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And having given thanks, then push into God's purposes for you. Again, Acts 9.22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Saul pressed in to his calling, to his commissioning, to his giftedness. And he didn't let the the fear, the skepticism, the opposition, the resistance of, 
of other Christians holding him back from what he knew God had called him to be and to do. And neither should you. Finally, when you're misunderstood, reach out for a friend. When you're misunderstood, reach out for a friend. Let us consider, writer of the Hebrews wrote, how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And what the writer of Hebrews is pointing to here, I think, is the essence of Christian community because to be a Christ follower is to live for him in a world that is increasingly turning against Jesus Christ, against his kingdom. And here's one of the greatest reasons that you and I should choose Christian community, choose the church and not neglect it. If you don't want to really live for Christ, then you don't need the church. You don't need the church. In fact, if you don't want to live for Christ, the church will seem irrelevant to you. It's not that it is. It's just that it seems irrelevant to you. It's a function of where you are, who you are, what you're all about. And I'm not talking primarily about church services, but that's kind of a part of the whole picture. I'm talking about the church as a community. If you don't want to live for Christ and and Christian community seems irrelevant, then you're probably not a Christian in the first place. I often wonder when when I hear people that I I think are Christians say, well, the church is kind of not that important. Really? Jesus would have a different perspective because he died for the church. See, we're, we're to consider how to keep on stirring each other up to a life of love and service. And, And that stirring up actually means to kind of poke and prod each other, kind of stick it to each other. Actually, the actual translation, consider how to stick it to one another to stimulate a life of love and service. Amen. See, and and that life of love and service requires courage, doesn't it? To encourage doesn't point to the church as merely a kind of a a feel-good, rub-your-back, anything-goes kind of community. Well, we're just encouraging each other. No, to encourage means to instill courage, and the only reason you do that is you desperately need it. But the courage to live distinctive lives of love and holiness and to share our faith with, with lost and sometimes hostile people in a world where opposition to the gospel is still very much a reality will always, always, always require great courage. And that's when you need a little help from your real friends, real Christ followers. If your heart belongs to Jesus today, it's because he chose you. It's because he's working in you so that he can work through you. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi and said, For I am confident, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion unto the day of Jesus Christ. And I'm confident of that. Life Point Church, for you as well. Let's pray. Lord, would you take these things? that we've thought about this morning, would you apply them to our minds and then to our hearts and then to our lives that we would live lives of genuine followership, of genuine discipleship of your son Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen.